Welcome to this panel discussion where young people will be sharing their views on development challenges and opportunities for least developed countries like Malawi. Today we have a panel of young people. Even though they are not attending these review meetings, they will tell us their thoughts and ideas which will be shared with LDC conference delegates. This panel discussion has been organized by the United Nations and the government of Malawi. I am Rebecca Pritigo from UNICEF Malawi and co-hosting this discussion with me today is the Director of Youth in the Ministry of Youth, Judith Msusa. Thank you very much Rebecca for that background. Apart from the Eastern Blue Program of Action, LDCs are part of a global community, uh, also adopted 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, the 23rd Agenda contains 17 goals that governments committed to strive to achieve with the overall objective at continental level in Africa, uh, we have agenda 2063. And coming down to Malawi now, we have just launched Malawi 2063, which also is a blueprint uh, giving Malawi the vision that it would want to see in the next 2063 years. At the center of implementing all these development blueprints is the acknowledgement of the important and critical role of young people. It is common knowledge that globally uh, at continental and the country level, young people are in majority. The demographics therefore uh, demand that we seek the views of young people, but even more relevant is the fact that their ideas are valid as they are SDG accelerators. Through this discussion, young people have the opportunity to influence policymakers participating in the Africa Regional Review Meeting to focus their attention on youth as SDG accelerators in their preparation for the UN LODC conference. And again, through this platform, young people have the opportunity to bring together inspiring and innovative youth in initiatives and ideas from Malawi that can encourage increased youth participation in efforts in accelerating SDGs in LODCs. I would like therefore at this point in time to invite our panelists to introduce themselves, starting with the Polytechnic and then Chancellor College, Catholic University, College of Medicine, Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources and Nzuzu University in that order. In the introduction, please mention your name the college or a university you're from, the year of study, and also the program. Over to you, our panelists. I'm um, Sarah Togozani Kachingwe. I'm from the Polytechnic. I'm studying and surveying. I'm in my fifth year. Um, my name is Maureen Kajala. I'm studying at Chantula College, a senior year student doing education program. Uh, my name is Jonathan Mkandawiri from Catholic University of Malawi. I'm studying law and in fifth year. My name is Andrew Maulidi. I'm from College of Medicine. I'm studying medical laboratory sciences. I'm in my fourth year. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Kunkeka. I'm from Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. I'm studying agricultural economics. I'm in my third year. Uh, this is Monica Nyanguru from Zuzu University. I'm studying very chain agriculture in my third year from the various courses and programs that our young panelists today are studying, we see we have a pool of diverse uh, talents. So we hope to um, enjoy an interesting discussion on the four key areas that will be under review at the Africa Regional Review Meeting that is coming up. Our first topic is youth and building peaceful, just and inclusive societies. Sustainable Development Goal number 16 highlights the importance of peaceful communities, access to justice for all, and building effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. This includes ensuring freedom of expression, access to justice, respect of human rights, reduction of inequalities, and elimination of social inclusion. Each society must have strong and efficient institutions, ensuring the rights of its citizens are fulfilled. So our first question will go to you, Monica. And I would like to know 
our young people fully engaged in building peaceful, just, and inclusive societies in less developed countries? Okay, I'm saying they're not fully involved because we can clearly see that uh, young women are left out when government is doing their, they are formulating, they are doing their decision making. Uh, most young people are not involved. So then how do you think we can fully involve young people to do this? Since this is something that we're not uh, doing so well at the moment, what do you think should be done so that we can? Yeah, what we can be done is to engage the young people in decision making. In whatever the government is doing, they have to engage the young people. They have their own idea uh, that must be happening in this country. Now, if government is leaving out these young people, that means they cannot hear their views. They cannot hear what they are trying to say on some development in, for this country. Now, the best way that can be done is to engage the young people. Let them uh, listen to these young people. Let them uh, give them chance to voice up their concerns. In whatever government is doing, they have to engage the young people. Be part of all the decisions that is being taken by the government. Young people should be there. In each and every step, young people should be included. If we leave out these young people, that means we are leaving out the majority of this country. How can this country develop if we leave out the, the majority of this country? Young people are the majority of this country. Now, we need the ideas of young people. If we, we want to build peaceful and uh, uh, peaceful uh, societies, we need to engage these young people. We may say that these young people are violent. We may say these young people are, are, are protesters, but why are they doing this? It, be, it is because the government is leaving out. It is not listening to them. Now, the best way they think government could listen to them is holding videos, doing pro 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 protesting. It's, it's the only way they feel government would listen to them. Now, what we are saying, government involve us in every decision you are taking, involve us, hear us out, listen to what we are trying to say. We have the capabilities, we have the ideas. We want to develop this country. If we work together, if we, 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 we are all engaged, that means we can build this society. We can build a peaceful society and we can take this country up. up, up, up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. Interesting thoughts there. And I'll come back to you just to um, highlight what sort of forums, what sort of ways you think that uh, young people can be engaged. But for now, I want to come to you, Jonathan. Um, the same questions. Do you think young people are fully engaged in building peaceful, just and inclusive societies in less developed countries like Malawi? Uh, thank you so much for, for the question. Uh, I don't think I don't think like young people are fully like involved in uh, uh, in regard to peace and the, and just and inclusive society because in recent years we have seen like a lot of uh, a lot of like, protests a lot of dispute in Malawi involving young people so due to that I don't think young people are fully involved in peace and just society so that that is my my my, my, my understanding. Thank you, Jonathan. What, what can be done to change this? Uh, I think to, to change uh, this situation, I think first of all, we need to put up system like institutions and that can uh, strengthen trust and social contract. Uh, uh, that can social contract between the government, the institutions and, and the young generation. In that way, it will put the younger generation much more to, toward the peace and the unjust society. We also need to uh, facilitate meaningful participation for the younger generation to in uh, like general activities of the society. In recent years, we have seen a lot of like a, a lot of public uh, institutions, private institutions, leaving out the youth. So due to that, youth are like a, the younger generation are angered. That's why you see that they, there are a lot of protests. For example, like if, since 20, 2019 to twenty twenty. 
well, I've seen a lot of like uh, demonstrations in Malawi. Those demonstrations were there because the youth were unhappy. And they were unhappy because they're not part and parcel of decision making. So we need to take, we need to make them part and parcel of our decision making. They should see the problems that are there and they should be part of the solutions. We should not take them as like a, just only a part of, like we need to solve problems for the youth. They should part of the, be, part, be part of the, of, the, of the panel, part of the discussions, part of the conferences, whatsoever. We are like in resolving the, those kind of uh, problems. So in that way, they understand whatever is happening and be part of it. Another, another thing that we need to change, we need to change our mindset. In most societies, like in, in our country, we think when we see a young person, we think of trouble. So because of that, it's very difficult to involve someone whom we think the person is a, is a troublesome. So when you, you see a young person, we only involve that younger person uh, with regard to trouble. In villages, it's very difficult and it's very rare to see a younger person be part of like a community committees or part of like a chief, uh, chief committee. It's very difficult. It's simply because they don't trust the youth. So when you see a younger person, you, you take that person as also has some kind of contribution that can make toward the society. So that also needs to change. We also need to like a, try to publicize more on what the what law the, on, on the law of the uh, the youth that partake into to, toward the peace that and, and just society. There are a lot of things that are happening. The youth are doing a lot of like a contribution toward peace, but we don't see them in newspapers. We don't see them in media. So we need to publicize more. In that way, we encourage other youth, other, other generation and other, other members to participate. And the, in that way, we'll see that the younger generation have more to, uh, to contribute to, this, to society rather than being integrated. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Quite uh, comprehensive ideas there. Um, I'll now come to you, Andrew, on the same topic. Um, what is your proposed way of ensuring that young people are at the forefront in building peaceful, just and inclusive societies in the context of Malawi and other least developed countries? Andrew. Okay, thank you. So I really believe that young people are supposed to be at the forefront. They're supposed to be involved in building a peaceful, just and inclusive society. So I believe the other problem why we don't have a peaceful country here in Malawi, it, why we have a lot of violence, a lot of theft, is because a lot of young people are just, are just staying at home. They don't have jobs, they don't, they, they don't have things to do. So for example, if, if, if you don't have anything to do and someone comes and say, let's go and go, and, and have violent demonstrations, you will surely go because you have nothing to do. When someone comes, let's go and steal. You don't have a job, so you go and steal because someone has come with, with an idea, let's go and, and, do some, and do something that is violent. You, you go because you have nothing to do. So I think the proposed way is, is to give young people things to be doing so that they should not just be staying at home so that we should prevent the virus. So number one, at individual level. So apart from waiting for the government to sort the issue of unemployment, you know, the one million jobs which we are promised. So I think what we can do as young people is to start cultivating on our talents. So for example, if you are good at sports, you are good at music, you are good at drama, you are good at poetry, you can start investing your time in, 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 in that thing. You can start putting your, your time and your energy in that talent so that that talent should, should make you busy, should give you maybe income, should give you money. You can start investing in, in your talent. So I think as young people, it's high time we stop just depending on employment. We should start cultivating on our talents. For example, you can look at that young person, Edin Jewish. He's, he's doing good with his music. So we can emulate that. We can start cultivating on our talents. So another thing at community level, we can involve the MPs, 
the councillors, they can organize, they can be organizing bonanzas, they can be organizing music shows so that they should keep the youth busy. They should keep the youth busy doing something so that they cannot be involved in violent things, they cannot be involved in theft so that they are busy doing something. Yeah, so that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I think you raise an important point um, that makes us reflect on the interlinkages between the various development goals that we're discussing. Building peaceful, just and inclusive societies, linking that to youth employment. Um, I think that's important also to say as you're achieving uh, one goal um, that also uh, affects um, our achievement of other development goals. And so uh, our last question under this topic comes to you, Monica. Um, I just want to hear your thoughts on, you talked about uh, how young people must be engaged, must be involved, the government should seek the opinions of young people. I just wanted to know what, what thoughts you have, what ideas you have in terms of the platforms that can be used. How can government um, get the views of young people um, in a way that is inclusive um, and also, um, uh, ensure that these these ideas are incorporated. What forums uh, do you think can be used to do this? Okay, we uh, uh, the forums uh, the youth can be uh, engaged in uh, different forums. Like uh, as Jonathan has put it in the community development committees, the youth should be included there so that they should be. Uh, contribute on the, uh, the development ideas that, that they have, but also the, the media, we can use the media. The youth should contribute uh, or say something on what they think that can help the government uh, or through the medias. Well, we, we can be doing what we, we, we just, we just uh, what we are just doing now, uh, it's one way of the forum that could be used for youth to speak up their ideas and contribute on uh, the de development of this country. Now, it, it, it's, it's uh, quite a lot. Uh, we have to use our media that we have in this country for the youth to contribute, uh, to say something on what, what, what they think could help them and be engaged in the uh, different activities that they can uh, build the uh, peaceful and just societies. Yeah. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, we'll now move on to topic two. Over to you, Judith. Thank you very much, Rebecca, my co-host. Quite interesting discussion um, from topic one. Now moving on to topic two, which is on youth and achievement of strong and sustained growth and robust employment generation in the era of technological advancement and innovation. Uh, one of the ways in which we can achieve sustainable development is to promote sustained inclusive growth, full and productive employment and a decent work for all, but more importantly for young people. As we have mentioned, the majority of uh, the population globally in Africa as a region and in Malawi is composed of young people. We must support domestic technology and research as well as innovation. Now, Jonathan, uh, why is it that most least developed countries have not sustained growth and robust employment for its young people? Uh, thank you so much for the question. I think there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of reasons, a lot of grounds why uh, we like have high employment and we have not like capitalized on your uh, employment in Malawi. I'll use an example of Malawi. Uh, one of one of the reasons is like a financial crisis. In every country that has financial crisis, it has high rate of unemployment. It is very difficult to find like a lot of people uh, being uh, employed where there's financial crisis. For example, I can give like a, a recent rate due to COVID-19. There are a lot of people who are unemployed because of financial crisis. So financial crisis is one of the reasons why we have high rate of employment. And in Malawi, in Malawi, basically our economy is poor. 
So because of that, we will find that like a lot of younger generations, they are they're unemployed because there's no work because of financial crisis. So that is one of the reasons. Another reason is skills and matching. In Malawi, we have like a lot of people who aren't educated. The younger generation, they're a lot of like they're educated more than ever. But you find that eh, businesses, they have like a, they need people who have no skills like those that have been obtained by, by students from investors. So we have unmatched skills. Our curriculum is mostly based on what is not under the ground. So because of that, we have an unskilled matching. As I said, it's easy, it's uneasy to find like employment. Another reason is lack of entrepreneurship and life skills education. Our curriculum in Malawi is basically like based on traditional uh, system. So it doesn't mainly focus on vocational or entrepreneurial and the, uh, or maybe like a, uh, employability tra training. So you find that it, there are a lot of uh, like a, uh, graduates, but they don't have any experience. They don't have any like a, uh, entrepreneurship uh, skills or educational skills that can help them uh, to do uh, like a, what is required in employment. So due to that, it's very difficult to find uh, employment because basically, uh, companies and institutions need experience and that we don't have in Malawi because of lack of training and lack of skills in, in our education system. Another reason also is like a lack of capital, access to, to capital. Because of that, you find that like there are high, this highlight of unemployment in Malawi. It's very uneasy for a, a young person to obtain loan from the bank because they need collateral and you, you don't have like you're just a graduate from university where we get the collateral. So because of lack of access to capital, it's very easy to do something and employ someone else. So because we don't have a lot of things to do, as, as an annual side, we don't, have, we don't have like a lot of job opportunities. So lack of access to capital is also another, another reason. Another reason or another ground is the uh, uh, digital dividend. Like in Malawi, like I said, our education system is basically supported with like a traditional mechanisms. So they don't have any skills or they don't have resources to buy technology uh, that can, can assist in a uh, digital system. And yet right now at current rate, we are in like a, a, a global situation where technology is more advanced. So we need that skill to find employment out there. But as, at the end of the day, because of lack of resources whatsoever, institutions, they don't provide my skills or uh, technological uh, skills. So because of that, we have high level of employment because they need skills, like technological skills, which we don't have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, Jonathan has ably presented the issues um, that prevents LODCs from sustaining growth but also creating robust employment opportunities for, for young people. Uh, moving on, Stella, how can we achieve strong and sustained growth and robust employment in least developed countries, building on what Jonathan has just explained? All right, um, first they would have to understand what we mean by when we say sustained growth. When we say sustained growth, it is a growth that is that can that can be maintained without creating economic problems in the future. And now, according to the statistics, by 2038, Malawi's population will be doubled by then. That means if we are to make any development in Malawi, we need to plan accordingly so that when we reach that state whereby our population has grown, we shouldn't be disturbed by looking back. To, do, to redo the developments that we did in the, in the past years. For example, when we're building, when we're building schools, hospitals, I'll, I'll suggest that when we're doing all these things, we have to plan according to the, to the population that we're about to have in this country. For example, when they're building the previous schools, the institutions, for example, from my school, now they're busy building, constructing different buildings just because 
the intake is growing now. There are so many people that want to go to the universities. For that, that does not mean only it's happening only at my school, even at the Polytechnic, they're building different, they're building different buildings just to accommodate everyone. So for the government, as they are planning for the, for the future, as they're planning to develop this nation, they need to plan in that line so that when we reach that state, we shouldn't move back, we should move forward. When the new population is coming in, we should be able to, to accommodate them and to move forward. Because this is a bit of time consuming, because it's like we keep on doing the same thing previously. We keep on doing the same things many times, which is not good for, for it is consuming most of our time. And according to us, the way we are planning the vision 2063, if we, uh, if we are to achieve that, we need to be planning according to the, to the population that will have by then. And on, on, the, on that as well, we need, to, we need to think of the future generation because right now we need a good environment. We need, we need oxygen, we need different things. Right now, I can say we're enjoying the Malawi because it has different beautiful sites and the like. But when we, if we keep on building, on building the buildings using the timbers and the like, we will see that we, we cut a lot of trees and the, and the like. But then for us, we need to be considerate for the people that are coming after us because those people will need what we have now. So we need also to conserve the environment as we're growing because that's what it means by the sustained, that's what it means by sustained growth. And the other part of my question is, um, uh, how to can we achieve the lowest employment? Um, right now, as we can see, we have a lot of graduates in Malawi, but most of these depend on the government to employ them and uh, the few organizations that we have. But then, if we are to if we are to improve on that, we cannot say that the government will grow someday and then it will employ every graduate. Now, we need to come up with ways. I was thinking that what if they bring a system whereby they take people that have great ideas for great businesses. They will write their proposals. They'll see how many people are they going to employ and what would they be doing. And then they support those people. They put them at that, they let them to operate their business in the first years to be tax free so that they grow. When they grow, that's when we start taxing them. But then this will have include a lot of, a lot of people that have graduated. And when we're building these, these local product uh, factories that produce, like, let's say the juice and the like, the uh, food and, and the other things. It does not only employ the people that are, that, are, that are educated. It includes even those people that do not have like much skill, much skill uh, that, that, don't, that don't have skills. Like those people that are involved in the manual work and the like. It means we're going to include a lot of people. Let's imagine we have, we have implemented this, and then we have at least 10 factories lining in this nation. How many people are we going to employ? We are going to cut, to cut that burden from the government and other institutions that, are, that people are always waiting. They, are have, they always have their eyes on so that they get them employed. Yes, that's what I think should be done. Amazing thoughts already coming up from uh, young people on this discussion. Coming back to you, Jonathan, any thoughts on how um, LODCs could address the challenges that you talked about that prevent them from uh, sustaining uh, economic growth and also creating uh, robust employment for, for its young people? Any thoughts around that? I think one of the way that can, they can help is like, a, uh, we need to, be, to come up with like systems and, and frameworks that can help like a uh, beautiful, like a facilitate uh, participation and also like a, uh, to facilitate uh, uh, discussions and initiatives that can help uh, uh, to achieve a robust employment and sustainable, sustainable growth. Because in Malawi, we usually have a tendency of making policies. And the, at the end of the day, no one, there's no one like trying to bring those processes into practice. So if you can have like initiative and frameworks that you help implement, you implement like a, those initiatives, I think that will help. So one of the ways that we can help is like a, to try to bring up initiatives and the frameworks that can help 
implementation of, of the ideas that we put in, like the policies that we that we have, have like a structure. So they can help in, in that way. And also we need like to come up with ways of how to build capacity in Malawi and capital. We cannot, like, like Stella said, the government itself cannot, cannot manage, the government cannot manage. So we need to find other ways on how to provide capital to the younger generation. So we need to come up with like systems like and frameworks and also like funding. We cannot just depend on the government or the bank. So they can help like in facilitating such issues. In that way, it will help to build up like a system that is like a sustainable growth and will provide like the best employment in Malawi. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, moving on, uh, we, we all agree that we are now in the digital era. Probably with the onset of COVID-19, we have seen the importance of technology than ever before. Schools nowadays are done online. Meetings nowadays are done online. Um, to Andrew, in this era of technological advancement and innovation, are young people in least developed countries doing enough to contribute to national development? So I would say young people, yes, try their best in when it comes to contributing to the national development when it comes to technological advancement and innovations. So young people try their best. So for example, young people are, are the ones that easily adopt the technological advancements and the innovations when they come as compared to adults and other groups of people. So young people accept the technological advancements very fast and then they utilize them in order to, to, to produce things for national development. For example, let's talk of maybe when, 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 when there is a new phone or a new laptop with, with faster internet that has come in town. So young people are the ones that come and grab those things in order to utilize them maybe for national development. For example, talk of the online learning that we are, we are always doing as university students, for example. So young people are the ones that are using this fast internet, these this gadgets that have come due to technological advancement. So young people, yes, try their best as compared to others and other groups of people in order to, to contribute to national development when it comes to technological advancement and innovations. And on the other part of innovations, so I think youths uh, are the ones that are fully equipped with knowledge and skills when, they're, when they are maybe coming from the universities and colleges. They have skills and, and knowledge in order to come up with new innovations and technological advancements. So youths, they try to come up with innovations. There's talk of that, that other guy who came up with that automatic hand washing machine that we use for, you know, we are amid this COVID-19 pandemic. So that there's a certain young man who came with, who came up with that, who came up with that automatic hand washing machine. So young people, yes, try. So they are, they are fully equipped with skills. They are fully equipped with knowledge in order to come up with innovations and new technological advancements. So they try their best in order to come up with these things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Judith. Um, and I agree, there are a lot of uh, interesting, interesting thoughts coming out of the discussion um, about how, how, how young people are quick to take up these new technologies and innovations obviously having an advantage over um, older generations and also the idea of sustained growth about how we can utilize uh, the resources that we have today while not compromising on um, 
uh, future enjoyment of the same. So I think we're really um, getting getting somewhere with the discussion. And of course, uh, another important point uh, in terms of how, how do we ensure that the policies, uh, strategies, frameworks that we already have in place are being implemented um, for us to achieve uh, sustain, sustained growth. So um, at this point, we'll take a short break. And when we return, we'll carry on with our third topic of discussion today. Stay tuned in. Welcome back to this panel discussion where we're hearing from young people on their thoughts, their ideas on the opportunities and challenges that least developed countries like Malawi are facing. We're moving into our third topic of discussion, which is youth and building resilience and sustainability, climate change and natural disasters. This is a point that Stella already um, hinted on in the, in the uh, previous topic, uh, talking about uh, how we can use uh, our resources in a sustained way. And this really, um, we're seeing a lot of this every Every day about how our everyday actions have an impact on the environment, on the on, on climate change, and how also that then may cause uh, natural disasters, um, leading us to sustainable development goal number 12, which is to take urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. I'll start with you, Maureen. Um, what role can youth play in mitigating the effects of climate change? Okay, thank you very much. One thing that the youth have to understand is that we are living today and we're going to be in this world. These are the people who go. This world will remain with us. Now, if we're not going to take care of this world, if we're not going to take care of Africa, if we're not going to take care of Malawi today, we're going to have problems now and in the near future and the next generation to come. Now, we are the ones that are vibrant today. Everything is about us. Like my friends have said already, when it comes to technology, we're the first people to pick up new technology. When it comes to new ideas, we're the first people to, to find new ideas. But the ones who are going to school today, we're the ones who are exposed, as we say. Now, my point is, um, we should be at the forefront as the youth to, to mitigate this uh, effect of climate change. One of the things, um, climate change comes in different dimensions. We have issues of global warming, we have issues of uh, uh, Poor distribution of rainfall. We are we are in amid uh, <clears throat> rainfall season now, but we see that the different areas are receiving different uh, uh, types of rainfall. Not necessarily that the other places are better than, than other places, but because other places cannot receive rainfall as other places because of the poor conditions of nature in those places. Like we have uh, we have uh, dry rivers, we have dry lakes, we have we don't have the trees there because. Uh, trees are the ones that aid um, uh, the distribution, the, the good distribution of rainfall. Now, as young people, we are the ones that know these things. Some people are there in the villages, they just cut down the trees. You don't know that if we cut down these, these trees, we're not going to receive rainfall next year or the other years to come. We are the ones that are well informed. We should be at the forefront, at the forefront to help uh, these other these other people, uh, these, uh, these elders, yeah? those people that are not as exposed as we are. We should be at the forefront like helping them, telling them that if we cut these trees in the next 10 years or six years, we're not going to have rain as we are having today. Uh, in most areas, um, young people uh, are, are sidelined. Now, this is this is it. Uh, they are sidelined because you guys maybe do not come up. Like some people have said, like my friends have said that uh, those areas they just see us as troublemakers because we don't even come up with the ideas. Like they are in the houses going out to play maybe football in the grounds. We don't even go like maybe to the chief authorities, yeah, to the chief uh, village authorities to tell them that, okay, uh, we have noticed that in this village, people, this is what they're doing. They're, they're, they're cutting down the tree and uh, maybe poor waste, poor waste disposal in the rivers. And with time, the rivers will dry up and these trees, these trees will go. And we're not going to have rain as we're having today. And we're, not going, we're going to have temperature variation, yeah? So we need to come up with these ideas. Let those uh, elders know that we have the idea. Let's not just stay in our villages, stay in our corners, and stay wherever we it is that we stay as young people and not come up with the ideas. We should be at the forefront, coming up with these ideas, telling them. Sometimes let's not just say that our elders do not listen to us. 
we don't go and tell them, we don't come up with our ideas. So one thing we should do is raise our ideas, inform them, this is what is right. Let's not just use the books. We, we learn these things in classes. We go to school, we, we learn in agriculture and geography, that this is what can affect rainfall distribution, this is what can cause global warming, this is what can cause situation of rivers, but then we just keep them in our books, in our notes, in our laptops. We don't use these things. So it's high time as young people, we use what we learn in class, we take academics outside the class, we take academics where, where we stay. Let's not just come, to, let's just go to school and then keep our knowledge to ourselves. Those people, they sent us to school. So they, they expect us to go get the knowledge and bring the knowledge home, bring the knowledge back to the community, give back to the community. So we are learning in the classroom, then let's give back to the community. They need these ideas. Because if we're just keeping them to ourselves, how are they going to know and why are we going to school? One thing, one problem that we have as Malawian youth is that we expect, I, I, okay, I am doing jobs. So I expect uh, after I do geography, then I should go and sit in an office. That has nothing to do with geography. So this is what happens. We do something and we want to do something contrary to what we have studied in school. We should stop this. Whatever it is that we learn in class, if it's something that has to do with the environment, this environment is very important. And one thing that you have to understand is that we can have the money, we can have the, whatever, we can have the resources, but if our environment is disrupted, everything is done. We cannot do, we cannot develop, we cannot, we can have the money, but then economics, economic, economics is nothing if the environment is disrupted. So as you, you have to understand this. This is what we learn in class. Let's get what we learn in class outside the classroom. And whatever it is that we have studied in class, let's not neglect it. Let's take it back to the community where we belong and yeah, the community that we want to develop in the near, the, 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 the community that we want to see in the near future. Thank you so much, uh, Maureen. Uh, very interesting thoughts there and a challenge to fellow young people to speak up and use their skills, take action to save the, the environment. And I think also um, very relevant for Malawi um, around issues of uh, rainfall, flooding, droughts. Every year we're experiencing um, these things which are also affecting uh, productivity in the area of agriculture and other areas. Um, moving on uh, on this topic, uh, I'll come to you, Sarah. How best can least developed countries like Malawi fully involve young people in building resilient and sustainable communities? Um, I believe there are many ways for young people to be involved in building resilient and sustainable communities, but I only focus on three ways. The first one being the education system. Um, as I earlier said, I'm a land surveying student. As the name already says, land, everything that I do in my program is done on land. Um, we work with construction companies, work with um, global navigation systems, but while we're doing this, yes, at school, we learn a little of environmental management, but it's not there enough. Like we need more. I've learned, I um, only heard the module once in third year and it wasn't enough. I believe that the education system should review these things. We should have more, more modules in these things. We should have more modules telling people, telling students on how to handle the environment and how to implement these things. Um, apart from that, I believe that if I was taught about the environment or climate change from a young age, maybe at nursery school, if I was taught to learn, if I was taught to plant trees, to take care of the environment, by now I wouldn't be struggling the way I'm struggling. I haven't planted a tree ever in my life. I wouldn't struggle like this if I was learned, if I was taught at a young age. So I believe the education system should also be reviewed. Kids should be able to talk about the environment at such a tender, tender age that when they're growing up, it's not a problem, that when they're growing up, they shouldn't struggle with, e, I should plant a tree or e, I shouldn't litter. Kids should, should be taught to recycle, to take care of the environment before it gets too late. That's the first method that I think would be good to implement. Um, the second way I believe um, psychologically, the youth are easily influenced, they're easily influenced peer pressure it's one it's a very good thing we have social we, if we use it wisely that is we have social media 
um, I believe a lot of us here on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we can use these things to help other people, um, to help other people take care of the environment. We have big public figures. If we put these public figures to talk about the environment, to talk about climate change, we can have all these kids talking about climate change too, because they're seeing someone else who is a great influence to them doing that thing or talking about that thing. And, it would be easier for them to also participate in that thing. So I believe it's good. I have an example. Lately, people have been talking about Ben Pirompande, his Facebook page. He's not talking about anything about the environment, but there are a lot of people talking about it all over WhatsApp. If we have someone like him talk about the environment too, we we'll have so many kids, so many children, the youth talking about the environment too. Um, lastly, I would think another way to get kids and the youth involved in resilience in, and sustainability of com communities is to bring up fun ways to do these things. Someone already said this earlier. I also think we can bring up competitions to trigger the um, innovative mind of kids or the youth. We can have different programs to let these kids compete, to bring up solutions to, um, to problems that we're facing. Through these competitions, we'll have lots and lots of kids trying to find ways and to bring the best way to change things for our country. Yeah, that's all I have. Thank you so much. And I think it's true what they say. Young people are, truly are innovative. Um, interesting ideas from you, Sarah, about um, how we can utilize even social media influencers um, to get young people interested and acting uh, to save the climate. Um, so this is really um, testament to the fact that young people really are innovators. Um, and if we give them the opportunity, they can do a lot to save, uh, to help us save the climate. We are moving now into the fourth topic of discussion for the day, and I will hand over to you now, Judith, um, for topic four. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, very interesting discussion going on on this platform. Um, I like it that young people are no longer sitting back, but are taking action. They are leading uh, the, the proposal to use the social media to influence action on climate change and environment, uh, the innovations that are being proposed um, to excite young people into action. These are welcome discussions and for sure they're going to influence um, a lot of um, discussion among policymakers. Uh, moving on to topic number four, which is ending poverty and hunger and enhancing human capital. Ending poverty and hunger is um, at the center of the concern of most uh, African countries. Uh, hunger is, and is a cause as well as an effect of poverty. The effects of, of hunger go beyond its terrible toll um, on those who suffer from it. Hunger has substantial economic costs um, at individual level, at family level, and even at, at, at community and, and country as a whole. Uh, mental and physical health um, is compromised where people are, are, are in starvation. It also cuts on productivity, the ability of people to produce and contribute to the economic growth of their economy, of their, of their countries, their homes, and even of, of, of the country. Uh, you agree with me that chronically hungry people cannot accumulate um, the financial or human capital, which should allow them to escape from poverty. Starting with um, Maureen, according to your understanding, what are some of the challenges that least the government countries uh, face in eradicating poverty and hunger? Okay. Um food security is what we are trying to achieve to say that we are eradicating hunger and poverty in Malawi, most or other low development countries. When the country is, like you have put it, when the country is hungry, when people haven't eaten, they can't do anything. That means let's start from hunger before we go to poverty because the, the highest, highest, highest um, uh, indicator of poverty in the world is hunger. If you don't have food, you are poor. You, I, I mean, people can, someone said, uh, people, when people have the money, but they don't have food in their houses, that's poverty, because you can't have the money without the food. 
Now, most of the problems that uh, these low development countries are facing is because these countries are poor. They don't have money. Now, mostly in urban areas, in low development countries, in urban areas, agriculture doesn't really happen in urban areas. We depend on the rural areas to supply food to the urban areas. And one thing that we have to understand is that in those rural areas, we don't really have the technological advancement that will enable them to have bumper yields to produce a lot of food that can be able to feed uh, the rural development dwellers as well as the urban dwellers. Because these rural, these rural dwellers, they sell their food to the urban areas. Now, the problems that we as low development countries are facing is because we don't yet have most of the ideas to have a lot to produce a lot of food every growing season. We have poor technologies, we, have, we don't have enough fertilizers. If the fertilizer is there, it's not even enough to cut to, to cut everyone in Malawi to, to be enough for every family, to be enough for every individual to be able to grow their crops. Now, the problem is that we are facing as low development countries that we don't really have the resources, we don't have the resources. The resources that we have are not enough. And the ones that we have, they're not just not enough, but they're not even helping. They are, they are little one, and they're also not for. Another thing that we're facing is lack of uh, technical expertise. Uh, we see that uh, for, for us to produce a lot of food or to, to, to produce a lot of uh, farm animals, we need to have those new ideas, the, the, the technology ideas or the hybridization idea. But, most of the people who are farmers in Malawi live in the rivers. They don't know how to use the food. You get a brow, you get a leader, you get a, a spraying machine, you get them to the villages. You give them, this is how we do it. They don't know how to use this thing. They will, they will either not use it or use it wrongly. But then the day we're not going to have even the food that we are looking for. So as most government countries, uh, the problem that we have is that we don't have the technical expertise to produce food. And that our urban areas, instead of our urban areas to be involved in agriculture, we wait for those rural, uh, to do, for those rural areas and those rural farmers, low-income farmers, to produce food for us. That is why we can't really uh, achieve the food security level that we want to achieve. And the lack of presentation on a global level. Most of uh, um, agriculture summits that happen uh, on an international level have poor representation of low-income countries. The, uh, the, the low-income farmers are not well represented in those uh, in those summits. So when it comes when it comes for time to defend food security, how can we curtail food safety, food insecurity in poor countries? These low development countries are poorly um, uh, represented, or they are represented but represented by people who are not even in, in agriculture. You find that someone is representing a country, a low development country, on those international meetings, but that person has nothing to has no idea about agriculture. They are trying to represent a farmer who is there out there in the outskirts of the villages with problems. They don't even know the problems that those farmers are meeting. So um, if those farmers were well represented in those summits, that means we would have at least achieved these problems. Those are the people who are directly involved in agriculture, but, um, but then they are not well represented in those uh, international summits. So when it comes to um, the issues of uh, Catalan poverty, they are there, they are there not knowing what to do. But then the people who went there, they're not even farmers, and they're not the ones who are producing food for the growing population in the low developing countries. And as well as poverty, the problems that we are facing is that we don't have the resources, yes? And also uh, poor uh, employment levels. Poor employment levels comes because we don't have places to work. Someone said, if you can, uh, I, I remember it was Stella. Stella said, if you can uh, give uh, people, you know, capital, start this business. These are the people you should employ. I think by the end of the day, we'll be able to, to have a country that has high employment levels. But first of all, as low, uh, uh, low income countries, we don't have enough companies, we don't have enough industries, we don't have enough institutions where these growing uh, populations of graduates can go and work. Now, by the end of the day, we have high employment rates roaming around the streets of urban areas in our country. That they're roaming around, increasing the, uh, increase the, uh, increase the urban dwellers that have nothing to do. By the end of the day, you have high, in, uh, high criminal rates. We're going to have uh, the, poverty ratio, the poverty rate will go because we don't have people who are making money on a daily basis. We have people who are demanding for money on a daily basis. We have uh, people walking down the streets of Malawi asking for money, but not working for the money. So the problem that we have uh, in as low development countries is that 
we don't have where people should go and work and get the money. We don't have the companies, we don't have the industries, we don't have the institutions. Schools are, schools are not enough where teachers can go and work. Hospitals are not enough where nurses and doctors can go and work. We don't have enough uh, companies where all these engineers and uh, um, um, lawyers we are, we, are, we are producing every year can go and work. So at the end of the day, we're going to have this high probability because large government countries do not have the resources to have where people should work. And agriculture is poor and agriculture sustains it. Most, uh, an example of Malawi, Malawi is an agro-based country. So Malawi is an agro-based country. We survive on, on agriculture, not just for consumption or uh, not just for food, but also our economy depends much on agriculture. But the agriculture that we depend on is not well supported. Most people that are involved in agriculture are rural urban dwellers, are, are rural dwellers rather. They are not worried informed. They don't have the information, they don't have the technology. So it's a big problem in low developed countries. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Maureen, for that elaborate um, presentation of issues according to your understanding as to why least developed countries are not. Uh, able to eradicate poverty and 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 ending um, hunger, I think you alluded to the fact that most LODCs um, are relying on agriculture, or most are uh, agro-based, and uh, the the agriculture sector is not well supported. We are over relying on rural areas to support growing urban population. Uh, which uh, its production is based is 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 manual, and is not well uh, advanced technologically. Uh, moving forward to uh, Monica, are you there? Uh, what are your thoughts on on this very same issue? What do you think on your own understanding? Uh, what are some of the challenges that less developed countries face uh, in eradicating poverty and and hunger? Monica. Yes, uh, as much as uh, already been said by my friend Maureen, but uh, I will also highlight some of the challenges that I feel uh, is causing these LODCs to, 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 to have some challenges to eradicate uh, uh, hunger and poverty. And uh, these uh, challenges are uh, natural disasters and pandemics. We are, we can agree, you can all agree with me that now we have this COVID-19 pandemic amongst us. And all the resources, most of the resources uh, of our country is diverted to this pandemic to, 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 to end this, to, 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 to try to control this pandemic. And th th this gives a challenge to, 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 the, to, the, gov to the government to, to uh, all the plans that were there to, to, to deal with poverty and the hunger, uh, they are affected because of these pandemics. And even natural disasters, we talk of floods. Uh, these floods affect most families and they affect them because these floods will sweep away their food, their, their clothes, the basic needs are all gone. And the, the, this, uh, the, the, these are some of the challenges that the government is facing in, in trying to, to end this uh, po poverty and uh, hunger. But also we can talk of uh, uh, HIV and AIDS. Uh, HIV and AIDS ha has also affected the uh, lives of many Malawians greatly. And we, we, we all know that most families are now headed by young, young people just because parents have gone because of HIV and AIDS. And we, these are some of the challenges that are contributing to uh, government failing to fulfill, to, to, to end this poverty and hunger. And we, we, we need to do, it's something that we need to have, uh, as my friend has already put it, we, we need to, to, to dwell much on, we know, we know that we rely much on agriculture. We have to have some uh, proper plans on how we can uh, help to end this hunger and, uh, and, and poverty. Uh, thank you very much, Monica, uh, for uh, your contributions. Um, 
starting with Stella, how can we enhance human capital development in least developed countries so that they're able to contribute to the economic development of, of these countries? Um, according to the statistics, the, percent, the 40 to 60 percentage of the GDP can be attributed to, in, to investment in the human capital and the increase, increase, increasing the product, increasing the productivity. And it is believed that no country has achieved sustainable economic growth and development without sustain, sustain, substantial investment in the human capital. According to Rena, previous studies have shown that handsome returns to various forms of human capital has, uh, can be attributed from the basic education, research, training, training by doing, and also human capital building. Um, we can see here like that we need to have we need to be serious in focusing to instill skills in different in the in different people, either being either, either be the educated ones or those people that are in different areas, because we all have the energy to put this our this nation on different steps. Um, what can be done in order to enhance this, this human capital? Uh, firstly, I would say providing quality education, both in the primary, secondary, and the tertiary sectors. Uh, like like my, my colleagues have said that uh, the curriculum that is offered at the different levels of our education system, they are not really relevant. They are more of theory. So I would suggest that what if, or it, it may take time for you, for the government or the Ministry of Education to, to change the whole to change the whole syllabus to be the new system. What if we, we carry on with this syllabus that we have at the moment, but we should have the program whereby the people, different people with different skills and technologies, technology, uh, innovative skills, they go to the primary, secondary schools and teach those, those, those learners that are there, those different skills, so that they are not only taught the theory part, but then they also know the things that are done in the by, by so those people are, are, be, are reaching their tertiary, the tertiary level. So like um, they, they were taught to, they were taught different skills in their when they were still young in their primary and in their secondaries. And on the other thing is uh, supporting the technic technical colleges. How? I know these people, they rent a lot of stuff, which are, which are done, which are more by doing. So I would suggest that what if the government support at least a few people to go in the other countries to learn what they're doing? Like, uh, let's say China, the, the, that country has a lot of skilled people and they are more with this has one thing. So if the government supports at least uh, 10 people to go there and then they come back and teach other people, we're going to have a lot of skilled people. And as I said, like in area on that, this is another surest way for the couple of us to develop our nation. Um, another thing where you mentioned that something that says that if one is hungry, they cannot be able to contribute, they cannot contribute uh, their full potential to the growth of this nation. Um, one thing I've noted is that Malawi, we are more of, of the step of food, the maize. We, are, we only rely on maize, but then looking at our nation, we produce a lot. What if we introduce, we, we like civic, civic educate our people that they start to depend on, on other crops like cassava, uh, potatoes, and they like so that maybe what what maybe if we first like uh, the problem we had was it in 2018 we had we we we'll, we ran out of maize in the camp in the country and it was chaotic. By then, um, in each and every discussion, I keep on hearing of the importance of education, um, not just may education but quality education, which is also relevant to our needs uh, as a country. It keeps on coming over and over again. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, quickly going to Sarah, do you have um, anything to share with us on how uh, least developed, developed countries can um, enhance capital development, human capital development? 
Um, I would just add up on what Stella has already said, which is education. Um, I believe that the best way to get through um, enhancing human capital is through education. As Stella already said that human capital is more to do with skills, training, intelligence, and health. I believe that if Malawi would improve the um, education system, that we shouldn't have people relying more on private schools rather than um, going to public schools. If public schools and private schools were all on the same level, we'd have more people who are educated. Um, I, we already know that not everyone who's educated will get a job, but it's better to have more people who are who are literate than people who are illiterate. So if Malawi could bring up more, more ways to improve the public system, the public education system, so that we can have more people, more kids in the village going to school to improve um, our human capital and enhance it more. Um, apart from that, I would also think uh, Malawi should focus more on empowerment through economic improvement. Um, someone already said that people can get loans, but they'll have to pay collateral. I feel like um, Malawi should improve that. Um, we can have people taking loans to uh, start up small businesses. Um, it shouldn't only be um, rich people who have access to economic resources. Poor people should also be able to get um, economic resources. So we can have um, people getting small, say getting small loans for small businesses without collateral so that they can start up. Not only educated people should be able to enjoy our Malawi, even the poor should also be able to enjoy Malawi. Uh, I think that's all I was saying. Thank you very much, Sarah. As I said, we are running short of time. I wish I could recap on each and everything that you, our panelists have mentioned, but trust you me, uh, these are very good uh, suggestions. The discussion has been very good. Uh, allow me now at this point in time to sincerely thank each one of you for joining this call uh, or for having us on this discussion. On behalf of my co-host, uh, Rebecca Putiko, I would like to thank you all. Uh, we don't take it for granted. The contributions have been very uh, good and uh, we appreciate the invaluable contributions made. Surely uh, these discussions are going to influence um, the meeting, the upcoming meeting uh, for least developed countries. You have ably articulated the challenges that are there and how best these least developed countries can take advantage of young people, considering that the majority of the population in these countries are young or are young people. Uh, thank you very much and wishing you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.